The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. This is Kim Brown. I'm with the Rural Institute for Inclusive Communities Transition and Employment Projects, and Teresa Baldry and I will be your moderators for today. Live captioning is available for the session. Susan, if you could go to the next slide, please. To access the caption, open the captioning link that's on the slide in front of you. I've also posted it in the chat box. If you're not able to see your chat box, look to the upper right-hand area of your screen, and you should see an orange box with a white arrow in it. If you click on that, a drop-down box should appear, and one of the options there is chat or questions. The link for the captions is included in that chat area. When you open the captions, you'll want to open those in a separate browser window, and then you can position the window, shrink it, and have your slideshow open and your captions open below those. It's helpful to have your caption viewer at the bottom of your screen because the captions do scroll up. Next slide, please, Susan. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Montana DeafBlind Project, which is funded in whole or in part by the U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs, or OSEP, and through a contract with Children's Special Health Services at the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The statements shared in the presentation do not necessarily reflect the opinion of the sponsoring departments. All attendees are currently muted. If you want to ask our presenter a question or make a comment, please type your question or comment into the chat or question box. And only you, the moderators, and the presenter will be able to see what you've typed into that chat box. For those of you who requested Montana Office of Public Instruction renewal units when you registered, those will be emailed to you after the webinar, and it can take up to a couple of weeks for us to get those out. Please note that you do have to have requested the OPI renewal unit when you registered in order to receive that certificate. We do have a certificate of attendance, which will be sent out to you in a follow-up email that comes out today about an hour after the webinar has ended. Today's session is being recorded for the Montana DeafBlind Project and for the Transition and Employment Projects resource libraries. And by participating in the webinar, you grant permission for any chats and or questions that you submit through the webinar platform to be recorded. The video for today's webinar will be posted to our training archives pages, and I will post the URLs or website addresses for both of those training archives pages in the chat box just a little bit later during our webinar. The handouts for today's session are also available on both of those websites and they're available for you to download from GoToWebinar if you'd like to do so anytime during today's presentation. In order to find the handouts, again, look to the upper right hand side of your screen. There's a small orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that. When the dashboard opens, one of the options should say handouts, and there are four different handouts there for you, including the slide deck from today's presentation. We will have a short evaluation when the webinar ends. I'll put the link for that evaluation in the chat box toward the end of the webinar, and then it will also be in your follow-up email that comes out about an hour after the webinar ends. Please do take the time to fill out that evaluation for us. We look at all the responses and we try to use those to continually improve what we're offering and also to find out what kind of topics you're interested in for future webinars. So again, please do take the time to fill out that evaluation. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Ellen Condon to say a few words about the Montana Deaf Blind Project. Thanks, Kim. So the Montana DeafBlind Project is a federally funded project. Um, we are one of 54 state or multi-state projects in the country. And all the projects focus on providing specialized information, technical assistance, and resources to children from birth through age 21. And these are our students and children who have both vision and hearing impairments, um, and so are considered deafblind. 
So our project builds capacity and infrastructure so that students with dual sensory impairments are identified early, receive educational accommodations, and have support to transition into adulthood. Um, so this is one of our initiatives, the Foundations of Deafblindness, which we are so excited to have Susan Vyshinsky with us again today. We also work on um, ensuring that people are aware about deafblindness so that we can get children identified as early as possible to make sure that they have access to information through appropriate accommodations. We also, another initiative led by our project director, Teresa Baldry, is our communication initiative. So working with teams and an outside consultant to look at identifying communication um, for folks, for children who don't have formal communication. And then we also just finished up our work experience initiative. So if you have anybody that you're working with who you think may have um, both impact to vision and hearing, please contact our project. And I'm turning it back over to Kim and Susan, but thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. This is Kim again. And without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce our presenter for today. And I should have mentioned that this is the second webinar in our Introduction to Deaf Blindness series. If you missed the first webinar, the recording is posted to both of the websites. Um, I've put the URLs or website addresses in the chat box. So again, if you missed the first session, it's available for you to listen to and to share with anyone else you think might benefit. So once again today, we have Dr. Susan M. Bashinsky, and Susan is a professor of special education, and she's currently serving as the interim dean of the Missouri Western State University Graduate School. She has more than 40 years of experience working with learners who experience multiple disabilities, including deaf blindness and CHARGE syndrome. Throughout her career, Susan's research interests and areas of expertise include early communication, gestural communication and language development, augmentative communication, and cochlear implants for learners who experience deaf blindness. And with that, we'll turn it over to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Kim and Ellen and Teresa. Um, I'm excited to be joining all of you again today. Um, thank you for the great opportunity and thank you to our two captioners for working with us to, to make the presentation more accessible. I really appreciate that. Um, to those of you who joined us two weeks ago for the first webinar, welcome back. Glad you decided it was worth coming back. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to join last time, welcome and we're really glad that you're here today. Um, one thing that is always a challenge for me when we present in this kind of a mode, uh, pandemic world, we get it. I can't see you all and I don't know who you all are. So I at least want to try to get a little bit of information from you before we start our discussion that, con that will constitute an introduction to hearing loss and an introduction to vision loss. So Kim, if you could launch that first poll right now, that would be great. What I'm asking you all to do is to, um, I don't see the poll. Do you see the poll? Um, I'm asking you who you are, who is here? Are you a parent, guardian, family member, paraeducator, some kind of teacher, a general ed teacher, teacher of the visually impaired, deaf education teacher, special ed teacher? Are you a related service provider of any flavor? Are you administrator of some sort in some role at a district school level? And if I don't have you somehow, um, please provide in the chat who you are and, and what you do. Thank you. Susan, this is Kim. I just wanted to check and make sure that you are able to see the poll. The audience can, but I wanted to make sure you could. I don't see the poll, but we'll see if I can see the results. I don't see the poll itself, no. Okay. We'll give it another 30 seconds and then I will close the poll. And if you are not able to see the results, I will let you know what they are. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. I can see 
results in um, what looks like a chat box. It's not the chat, but I can see a little bit in there as it says collecting responses. So in that regard, I can see them. It's just very different than the first time, but that's fine. And um, this is Teresa in response to our other question. We have an individual has, who has identified themselves as part of the parent training and information center staff. We also have a family to family resource navigator joining us as part of the other. Wonderful. Now I see the results. This is great. I'm so glad we have some parent or family members with us today. We didn't a couple weeks ago, so that's fabulous. This is lovely distribution. Thank you all. Um, I appreciate that. I, I just like know, knowing who it is with whom I'm speaking. And Teresa, thank you for um, sharing who the other people are, because we just didn't, we couldn't have an endless list. I think it's worthwhile um, to try to give you an overall agenda of what I hope we'll be talking about for the next hour and a half. We're gonna start with vision. We'll look at the types of vision losses and try to give you some kind of a definition of each type. Acuity loss, visual field loss, then we have kind of an assortment of other types of vision losses that are not nearly as commonly recognized as acuity or field losses. And then I have for you a list of vision reminders, which is one of the handouts to which Kim uh, referred earlier. Then we're gonna do a parallel walk through hearing losses, types and definitions, talk about the dimensions of hearing loss, which, quite frankly, in my opinion, are pretty complicated. Uh, talk about other considerations regarding hearing loss. We'll take a quick look at an audiogram, primarily just to hopefully raise a little bit of a level of awareness of what an audiogram is and how we look at them. And then I have a parallel set of hearing reminders, which are, again, I, I view these as tips for what I hope will be some of your main takeaways from today. And the hearing reminders are also one of the handouts that you have um, available in the box. And I've lost my mouse, so I can't make the slide move. There is also um, an action planning form, which is the fourth of the four handouts um, folks from the Montana DeafBlind Project have provided for you. If you participated in webinar one, you can use the same sheet if you would like. Um, my purpose behind this is not to ask you to turn these in to me or to turn these in to the folks at the Montana uh, Project. It's just a matter of, I think, I'm, I'm giving away my own secrets at this point. Uh, for myself, when I'm listening to some new information or information even that someone is reviewing for me, if I don't make a note that, Susan, you need to remember this, or hey, you've never tried this before, write it down or I won't remember to do it. So I do have an action planning form that hopefully everybody will have one thing at least that they can write on there um, from today's discussion. And um, it was a suggestion last time that if you have any action planning steps of things you want to do, you want to try, if you could indicate those on your evaluation of today's webinar, that would be great because that could be meaningful to Kim, Teresa, and Ellen, as well as to me. So I appreciate your doing that. So here we go. Let's talk about vision. The major types of vision losses about which we'll talk today Acuity loss, field loss, contrast sensitivity, processing problems. Those are the vision problems located in your brain. And people say, well, we don't see with our brains. And yeah, we really do. And the processing problem, uh, the processing challenge about which we'll talk is CVI, which for those of you who aren't familiar with that acronyms, refers to cortical vision impairment. We'll also talk very briefly about oculomotor problems. And then there are, of course, you know, that catch-all category of combinations, mixed kinds of visual losses. So we'll start with visual acuity, uh, because I think, again, my opinion, this is, this is one with which 
the majority of people are most likely to be familiar. Visual acuity measures how well the eyes can focus sharply on an image. And the measure of visual acuity that you have for one of the learners with whom you work or your family member, it represents their central visual acuity. It doesn't, remem it doesn't represent the acuity or the clarity of the ability that they see out here. It's their central visual acuity. And this is that measure that you get when you go to a screening with a school nurse or into an optometrist or an ophthalmologist uh, office and you read the E's or you read the letters. That's visual acuity. So a visual acuity loss is simply defined as the decreased ability of the eyes to distinguish object details or to distinguish shapes. And typically, this is what we as teachers, educators, not sophisticated medical professionals refer to as how well does this learner see? How well they see up close, how well they see far away, how well do they see? That has to do with acuity. And there are several categories um, that really kind of run in a cascade. We can talk about a learner who is referred to as, quote, totally blind. And this is a person who, honest to goodness, does not perceive even shades of light or dark. This is very rare in the population of kids with deaf blindness or in the population of kids who experience vision loss. Um, but of course, for, for if you ever work with a learner, and I have worked with a couple in my um, 40 years. Kim, that was such a polite way of saying Susan's old, so I'll own that. Um, if a kid, if a learner has no eyeballs, they're not going to perceive even light and dark differences. One step above that is the ability to perceive light. And you might say, well, is that even useful at all? And it is. It's very useful because it can help kids from running into obstacles in the environment or knowing outside versus inside if it's a sunny day. So light perception doesn't really give a learner, provide a learner with functional vision, but it can be very useful information even from the standpoint of helping to ensure vis um, some minimal safety. And one big clue about this, like with a little girl with whom I worked one time, her name was Brianna, and we were really uncertain. Her family was uncertain. Her medical people were uncertain if she had any use, functional use of her eyes at all. But her family started noticing that even when she started crawling or moving around on her own at all on a bright sunny day, she'd crawl over or roll over to be by a window and stare out at the bright sunshine. So that's a clue that she's seeing that super bright light. Another step would be, a step up would be a learner who's categorized as having legal blindness, being legally blind. This is a visual acuity of 20 over 200. That's with that Snellen notation to which I referred. 2200 or less in the better eye. And that is really important that we're referring to the better eye, not the lesser of the two. And it's the better eye with the best possible correction. Uh, I think many of us participating today could qualify as having legal blindness if we didn't have our glasses or our contacts in. So better eye, best possible correction, a visual acuity of 2200 or less. A second way that a learner, and you say, well, this is sort of getting ahead of yourself, Susan, because you're talking about acuity, but I think it's important to mention in conjunction with legal blindness, if a visual field is restricted to 20 degrees or less, that also qualifies a learner for this categorization. Moving one step above that, you can talk about a learner as having partial sightedness, and these are measures that come from the Snellen notation, 2200 to 20 over 70. Again, it's better eye, best correction. Those, those elements stay the same. You can also, or you will also sometimes hear people using the term low vision. 
some people use the terms partially sighted and a learner with low vision interchangeably. Some people do not. But low vision refers to a severe visual impairment after correction, but the learner can demonstrate increased visual functioning through the use of optical aids, non-optical aids, environmental modifications, and so on. Before we talk about loss, Teresa, are there any key questions you think we need to clarify? No questions at this time, Susan, thank you. Okay. Um, so let's talk about visual field. Visual field refers to the amount of space that is visible to the eyes when a learner is looking straight ahead. So if we're talking about a field loss, we're talking about some kind of reduction, either from the sides or reduction from the middle out that, that to which a learner has access when that learner is looking straight ahead. You can't talk about a visual field loss if a learner is looking like this, because again, it's measured what their eyes are, are um, focusing on straight ahead. Typically what you'll hear about would be these primary categories of visual field loss. You can talk about a central field loss, all right? And we have an example here in a little bit. I think particularly with retinitis pigmentosa, with Usher syndrome, you're going to hear about a central field loss and that's when the learner's looking straight ahead. There's a blockage in the middle. Peripheral field loss is when there's a loss to the sides with the learner looking straight ahead. Um, I think I just misspoke, I'm sorry. Central field loss is um, not necessarily associated with retinitis pigmentosa as much as a peripheral field loss is. I misspoke and I apologize for that. You also hear about upper field loss, which means that if you're looking straight ahead, maybe from this part of the field is not visible or clearly visible, or you could talk about a lower field loss when like from here up I can see, but from here down, I've lost my visual clarity and my visual field. You can also talk about a single quadrant loss, and this is if you were to make an X and Y axis and you have one, two, three, four quadrants, sometimes just one of those four will appear to be a loss, and that is particularly, um, noticed in some learners who have charge syndrome and there are other issues as well so here is a picture of again if you're staring straight at your computer screen this is a picture of what a central visual field loss might look like all right and the text behind the loss is random all right you're not supposed to be able to read that i just put it there with the black spot to illustrate a central field loss and this is defined as if the inner 30 degrees, when you're looking straight ahead, if an area within 30 degrees of your vision when you're fixated straight ahead is missing, that's considered a visual field loss, central visual field loss, I apologize. This is an example of a peripheral visual field loss. And again, you'll see it's sketchy. It's not super black all the way around the edges, um, but it does illustrate the point that it's when you're losing vision around the edges when you're looking straight ahead. That's considered a peripheral visual field loss. And it extends when you're looking straight ahead outward 100 degrees. You know, if we talk about the straight plane when our arms are out like this, that's half a circle, which is 180 degrees. Well, when I'm sitting here looking straight ahead right now, I can't see my hands, I can't see my wrists. So peripheral field doesn't expect you, if you have normal vision, to see through a range of 180 degrees. You're only expected to see through a range of approximately 100 degrees. And if you don't have that 100 degree laterality, then you're considered to have a peripheral visual field loss. This is an example of what an upper 
visual field loss might look like. And if you had only one quadrant, then you could take either the right half of this black part or the left half of this black part, and that would be an example of a quadrant visual field loss. But this is a very common one. I chose this because upper visual field loss is extremely common among learners who experience CHARGE syndrome. And you might say, Susan, why are you mentioning CHARGE? Well, one of the reasons I mentioned CHARGE is because of all the genetic causes of deafblindness, CHARGE is the most frequently occurring in the United States. Over 1,000 of the approximately 10,000 learners from birth to 22 years of age who are on that deafblind census that Ellen mentioned in her remarks, over 1,000 of those learners do um, have CHARGE syndrome. So that's why I'm using them as an example for you today. And these losses, if you're talking about an upper field loss, okay, it's upwards 60 degrees. You're supposed to be able from when you're fixated straight ahead, you're supposed to be able to see 60 degrees upwards and you're supposed to be able to see 75 degrees downwards. And I think if you just stare straight ahead and you try to just imagine right now, you can see much more below your eyes than you can see above your eyes without tilting your head, right? And that's why the upper loss is defined as, as uh, less than 60 and a lower field loss is defined as less than 75 degree field, okay? I hope that makes sense. Questions, Teresa? Thank you, Susan. I do have one that has come in. Do glasses help with a visual field loss? That's a great question. So whoever asked that, I appreciate it. Typically, no, because the, the glasses are there to correct the acuity. The glasses are there to correct and, and increase the clarity and the definition or the how well a learner sees. Do glasses, do corrective lenses, in my opinion, have an impact on visual field? Yes, I think they do. Because they, even though when you're wearing glasses, right at the edges, you don't see more clearly, but certainly from the edges of your lenses, you see more clearly. So even though it isn't going to change the diagnosis of what the degrees, of the degrees through which you see, I think it does impact the utility or the functionality of your field vision because what you see out here is clearer when you have those glasses on. Does that make sense? If not, type no. <laughs> Try again, Susan. Are we okay, Teresa? I have a yes. Thank you, Susan. Okay, good. We like yes. So we don't have a whole lot to talk about in terms of contrast sensitivity, but I think it's important. Um, and I don't think it gets its fair shake of attention. How about that? So I gave it two whole slides today. Um, it's just how capable, what ability does a learner have to detect when there's an object, when there's a person, when there's an obstacle in his or her path, when there is low contrast in the environment, when there's low lighting, when the conditions in a classroom or school hallway or a community center or an employment site really aren't optimal. It really does become an issue. And you'll think back to what I said before about just that ability to contrast and, and be sensitive to light and dark. That interacts with this notion of contrast sensitivity. And it is definitely unquestionably affected by glare we're going to come back to that topic. The brightness of the lights, the color of the lights, and this this was the best example I could come up with to share with y'all. Um, what I what I mean when I say the brightness or the hue, and it it will not in ninety nine percent of the cases I believe impact your learners who experience deaf blindness. But I'm trying to give you something with which you might identify. And that's the notion, maybe you don't have this issue, I have this issue. Um, when I'm driving at night, some of the newer cars, their headlights look blue, or their headlights look like a brighter white than white. 
And some of the headlights on cars that are coming at me, they almost blind me because they seem so much brighter than those traditional headlights do. Maybe you've had some of those experiences, but that's what I'm getting at when I talk about brightness and hue. It's those kinds of changes, but in a controlled classroom, school, hallway, gymnasium, employment site. Contrast sensitivity also gives us input about size of the visual stimuli we need to use when we're when we're providing instruction for a learner and it also has to do with how complex visually stimu visual stimuli may be or just how cluttered i'm sure that some of you are um, tend to be more like me that you don't like a whole lot of stuff lying around even if it's stacked up it's better than if it's just scattered all over the place and we talk about visual clutter some learners, especially if they have challenges in contrast sensitivity, if you have a whole lot of stuff out on surfaces in your classroom or you have a whole lot of stuff on their desk, they're going to struggle because they can't sort it out. What's salient, what's not salient. Um, we also need to talk about the processing problems or cortical visual impairment. This can be defined as limited or inconsistent vision due to the brain not properly processing information that's sent to it through the optic nerve. And in, in the last webinar, you might remember my saying, people think we see with our eyes, but honest to goodness, we see with our brains because that's where all of the sensory information is processed, all right? So if there is some impairment or there's some problem in the visual cortex or the visual pathways in the brain that can result in inconsistent visual performance, that is one type of vision loss that might qualify a learner for the label of deaf blindness, right? It can be an inconsistent performance in visual skill. I remember one of the first times that this really dr was driven home to me, I was working with a young learner and we had those wooden, three-dimensional wooden numerals. And we were trying to do numeral identification and I would hold them up or I'd lay them on her desk or try to, and, and it was like, she didn't know, she was guessing. She was getting them right at like approximately a 50% rate and then I remembered a workshop that I'd been to about cortical visual impairment. And I remembered color, contrast, Susan, think about it. And I, so the next day I got some phone core numerals that were red and I displayed them on a dark gray cookie sheet. The kid got everyone right every single time. With the, and then I went back to the wooden numerals that same day, couldn't name them, couldn't name them to save her life that's an issue that you'll encounter that is an example of cortical visual impairment and you'll hear reds are great yellows are great they're usually the preferred colors then maybe orange but don't always count on that with some learners it may be blue or green or something else but remember that because in cortical visual impairment the actual anatomy of the eye the anatomy of the optic nerve is not impaired we also need to mention oculomotor problems. This involves a difficulty looking at or tracking the movement, following the movement, either horizontally or vertically or diagonally, the movement of objects, the movement of people. And it can also involve if the eyes just aren't working together in a coordinated manner, all right? Because the muscles, our eyeballs are managed by so many pairs of muscles. It's very complicated, all right? I think these words might help drive this home. I'll bet almost everybody has either heard of nystagmus or strabismus. Nystagmus is when you get that involuntary rapid movement of the eyes. It's usually side to side, but not always. But you look at some of the learners and their eyes are just going back and forth, back and forth. I can't do it as quickly as their eyes do. That's nystagmus. It's incredibly common in kids who experience cerebral palsy. Many children or young adults with Down syndrome will, will show this. 
Kids with fragile X syndrome will show this, and many kids who experience a traumatic brain injury will show this nystagmus. And you can understand how that can interfere with the functionality of your vision. We also will talk about strabismus. I think typically this is, lay people say his eyes are crossed, or his eyes turn in, or his, which is esotropia, or their eyes turn out, which is exotropia. But it's the notion of we've lost coordinated movement of the eyes. This eye turns in and this eye looks straight ahead or this eye looks straight ahead and this eye turns out. So you get a misalignment. Well, you know that's going to interfere with our functional vision because our two eyes are supposed to coordinate to help us perceive dimension and depth and distance and all of these kinds of things. Strabismus, strabismus is especially common to, in 40% approximately of kids with cerebral palsy will show some of this. And I think, um, like we discussed in the last webinar, the notion of kids who experience some kind of brain damage that results in cerebral palsy are very likely at risk for vision and or hearing loss because it's all brain stuff, right? So that's why we want to mention the oculomotor problems. And then finally, vision problems can occur in combination I don't need to read this to you. It can be any, all of the above, two of the above, anything. So with that said, Ms. Kim, would you please launch the second poll for me? I see it this time, thank you, lady. And I need to read it in case there's a problem. Which of the following, and you may choose all that apply. So choose one, two, three, or four. Which of the following are examples of vision loss that might qualify a learner for services under the label deaf blindness? Uh, and after we finish the poll, I do have one question for you before moving. Yes, ma'am, thank you. This is Kim. We will give another 30 seconds or so because this question requires some thought. Yes, it does. And I can tell the folks are thinking because the responses are coming in more slowly, which is great. Okay, we'll give another five seconds and close the poll. Excellent. Ladies, we've got a brilliant audience today. You participants did an outstanding job. The vast majority of you said that yes, any one of these four might qualify a learner for services under the label of deaf blindness. They certainly may. A field loss, an acuity loss, ocular motor problems, CVI. It all depends on the severity, right? And maybe that's why you hung yourselves up. You'd say, well, if the ocular motor problem wasn't severe enough, but if it is severe enough, it does, it might qualify a learner. And part of that's going to be if the ocular motor problems are severe enough, it's probably going to affect one of the others, either acuity or field. So excellent job, everybody. All four of the answers were accurate. Thank you, Kim. If you want to take that down and Teresa, the question, if you want to share that with me. Thank please. you, Susan. The question came in, is there any correlation between visual processing issues and auditory processing issues? <laughs> you jumped the shark on that one. Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. If you'll allow me to answer it briefly now, because I don't want to ignore you. 
not necessarily, but possibly. How's that for non-answer? Um, it certainly is true that auditory stimuli and visual stimuli are processed in different areas of the brain. Part of it is going to be associated with just the magnitude of the impairment in the in the brain. So many kids who demonstrate a CVI will also demonstrate auditory processing disorder, but I don't know of any statistics about what that percentage of correlation is. And I and I have a, a son, um, it's really as pertinent, I'm not just talking about my kid. My son is a neuroscientist and his area is auditory processing. And I've talked to him about this. And as far as he knows, there's not a correlation percentage of those two things. So it's not really a good answer, but it's the best I have and I'm sorry about that. Okay, so here we go. We want to take a walk through some vision reminders. Again, you have a handout with a total of 14 of these. I don't have slides on all 14 of them because we just don't have time. Um, there are, but I hope you will find these useful. And at the bottom of the reminders, there's a few things that I would call strategies just to take into account about a learner's vision. So I do want to talk about a few of them. Natural lighting is generally preferred for most learners. Fact. True. I don't know what else to say about that. The type of lighting that an individual learner needs will vary by that child's or young adult's specific type of vision loss. I think it is not uncommon that people think, oh, more light is better. With me, <laughs> as my eyes are aging and I've had cataract surgery, the brighter the light, the better. But that's for me. For certain learners with certain types of vision losses, more light is worse. And I would encourage you to think about that super brief discussion we had regarding contrast sensitivity. And uh, for kids who have myopia, or what is nearsightedness, again, that's what I think we teachers call it, nearsightedness, brighter light is better. Direct light is better. But for kids who experience spotty loss, like coloboma, that is not necessarily the case at all. One thing that I don't feel like I've seen enough teachers do, and I will put myself in that category when I was a classroom teacher, I don't think we give enough consideration to targeted lighting. And that's the notion of, you know, those old lamps that you put on a student's desk with the necks that you can bend over and target on their actual manipulatives or on their actual paper or changing the lighting and the brightness on a computer screen. Targeted lighting can be incredibly powerful, and maybe the light needs to come from behind the child so it diffuses on the materials, all right? Maybe it needs to be sitting right on the learner's desk and be focused straight down on the learner's materials. For some kids, that would be too bright. But I do encourage you to think about targeted lighting. It can be really helpful. I like colors. I use colors to emphasize things. Glare is your enemy. Folks, glare is an enemy, all right? For kids with almost any kind of visual challenges, glare is an enemy. Um, how do we control it? You can use window coverings. I'm sure that almost all of you, if not all of you, have walked into a classroom with fluorescent lighting. Oh, we love that, don't we? No, we don't. And, P and the teacher or someone will have draped fabric over the fluorescent lighting to try to reduce glare. That's really helpful. Um, if you laminate instructional materials, and if you work with learners who experience multiple disabilities, chances are you're going to laminate things because they get destroyed by kids who don't have good motor control or they have challenges with drooling and you don't want to be remaking things all the time. Laminating materials can be a disaster 
in terms of glare unless you buy the non-glare laminate. Well, we like to buy the non-glare laminate, but it's more expensive. So, you know, it's just a matter of you want to minimize glare. You need to minimize glare. If you don't remember anything else, please remember that. And by contrast, haha, -ha, that's a lame joke. I told you, Ellen, I can't make jokes. Contrast, contrast is our friend, all right? Contrast sensitivity comes up again. What are some simple things we can do to enhance contrast? If the floor covering in your home, parents, or the floor covering in your classroom is dark, then try to have light furniture if you can, or use light, bright tape to set off areas where kids need to be. If a, if a learner's desk is a light color or your dining room table is a light color, then put something dark on the surface. Use a really dark placemat. Use a dark covering to be able to help the learner focus on the instructional materials and make them stand out. Um, if you are able, paint the frame of a door to your, to your bedroom, to the classroom, to the art room. Paint the frame a different color. Paint the frame bright blue. Paint the frame red to contrast it from the walls so the kids have that marker. Um, you can outline, if, if your principals won't let you um, paint around your light switches, get colored painter's tape and put the painter's tape around the light switches or put the painter's tape around the plug if kids need to plug in their assistive devices or, or their computers or iPads or whatever they need to plug in. Try to enhance contrast in the environment. You will have seen this on the edge of stairs that there's a, my funniest memory of this is we, I went to a deaf blind international conference one time and it was this really snazzy, fancy hotel and it had this gorgeous spiral staircase. And so there were so many people with deaf blindness attending and the stairs were white marble and they were a disaster. So the day the conference organizers got there, they got out the, the yellow and black like crime scene tape and they put it on the edges of all those stairs down the spiral staircase. I thought the hotel workers were going to go apoplectic because it just interfered with the ambiance and, and the attractiveness of the hotel lobby. But it made those stairs functional because it contrasted the edge of the stairs. I think these are, are common sense kind of thing. You want to reduce visual distraction, keep clutter to a minimum. I'm going through these quickly because they're on your paper. Be conscious of size. I think we already talked about that. But also think about the distance a learner is going to be from a screen, from the materials, from the book you're reading, from the materials you're demonstrating. Distance impacts vision as well. So think about that when you're determining size. Even if a learner's visual system receives information, the learner might not process it accurately. So as I gave you the example with the numerals, the wooden versus the red numerals, explore with colors because we can't say red's always best, green's always worse. We can't say that, we don't know. And lastly, this is so important. Um, attending visually for a learner who has, ex who has a vision loss, particularly a significant vision loss, it can be exhausting and those learners really might demonstrate fatigue when you wouldn't imagine they would. So I, I encourage you to be conscious of stamina and what you're asking kids to do if it's attending visually and they have vision loss. Kim, could I get you to launch the third poll, please? And Teresa, while it's coming up, are there questions? No questions at this time, but I will let you know if I see anything, Susan. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to read it. I apologize. Regarding these visual reminders that we blew through real quickly here, which of the following is or are true? And it's another question where you may mark one, two, three, or four. Contrast should be reduced as much as possible. Contrast should be maximized. Glare should be reduced as much as possible. 
Increasing lighting is always preferred. Hey, Susan, this is Kim, and we'll give it about 45 more seconds. We're at about 50% voting so far. Thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and close the poll, Susan, and show the results. Oh, look, 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 look. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant people. The, the two correct answers are what are shown on my screen in green and kind of bluey purple. 94% said we should maximize contrast, absolutely, and we should reduce glare. Those are the two main things. Please take those home with you. Increased lighting will be preferred for some learners, but not all. And that's when I encourage you to think about diffused lighting, targeted lighting as alternatives. So thank you, Kim. And now we're gonna totally switch gears. If I can make the slides move, we're gonna totally switch gears. And for the rest of our time together, we're gonna talk about hearing loss and different types of hearing loss. The primary dimensions of hearing loss include the intensity or the loudness, the volume at which learners do and don't hear things or how loud or intense they need sounds to be in order to perceive and hear them. And then we're gonna talk about the frequency, which is the pitch of the loss, okay? So hearing loss, one way that it is commonly categorized, we don't have these clean categories in the same way we did with vision. I've tried to make this as parallel as possible, but it's really not, it doesn't fall out the same way. We can talk about unilateral or bilateral hearing loss. And the definitions are there. Basically unilateral is the learner has essentially normal hearing in one ear and some degree of hearing loss in the other. Bilateral is there's some kind of hearing loss in both ears, but the loss in one ear in terms of intensity and or frequency might not be the same as the loss in intensity and or frequency in the other ear. And you go, really? And I'd say, yeah, really. A learner might have mild loss with low frequencies here and severe loss of high frequencies here, you just can't predict. It, unilateral, bilateral really refers to the number of ears or the number of sides that are impaired. So we could talk about types of hearing loss. We talk about conductive hearing losses. We're gonna define these. Sensory neural hearing losses. Here's where we had a, a preview a few minutes ago with processing problems called CAPD, which again we'll define, and then that magical final category, which is combination challenges. So let's start with conductive hearing losses. Conductive hearing loss occurs when sound is not able to pass effectively from the outer ear, through the middle ear, to the inner ear, all right? It might have to do with the development of the auditory canal. Sometimes there's an atresia, it's closed off. Sometimes there's a blockage in the middle ear, in the external ear, earwax. Middle ear can be a blockage because of fluid. I would bet every person who's participating with us today has heard of this. Middle ear infections, right? Otitis media, fluid in the middle ear that blocks the effective conductance of sound. It can be a tumor that creates a blockage. And as I said, otitis media middle ear infection is very, very, very common. And if it persists over enough months, that can result in 
really permanent, that's not good. Long-term effects on a child's uh, communication development, if that sound is not conducted reliably over an extended period of time. Conductive hearing losses attenuate the sound. What that means is because of the blockage, whatever it is, tumor, wax, fluid, whatever it is, narrowing of the canal, it weakens that sound because the little bones in the inner ear don't move with the same intensities. And so they don't, uh, and the eardrum doesn't vibrate with the same intensities when the sound that's coming through, the auditory stimuli that are coming through doesn't do so with the same strength. And that's how you get the weakening of the sound, which can then result in a conductive hearing loss. Before I ask for questions, I wanna go through, please, sensory neural hearing loss, and then we'll see if there's issues with contrasting conductive, which we just finished talking about, and sensory neural hearing loss, which we're going to talk about now. A sensory neural hearing loss is caused by poor development of the inner ear, the cochlea, and or the auditory nerve itself. Way inner ear, the cochlea, the, the thing that looks like a snail shell, or the auditory nerve itself. And chronic middle ear infections may cause sufficient damage to result in a sensory neural hearing loss. This is where I almost got ahead of myself on the last slide. But it may, if the duration is long enough, result in a sensory neural loss. A second reason that might be behind a sensory neural hearing loss is what's called auditory neuropathy, or sometimes it's abbreviated in case reports as AN. Uh, approximately 10% of all sensory neural hearing losses are believed to be a result of auditory neuropathy. Um, and these are ab abnormalities either in the auditory cortex or in the brain stem. And you might have heard of an ABR, auditory brain stem response, that if, if an audiologist cannot get reliable or feels he or she cannot get reliable hearing results from the typical raise your hand if you hear this sound kind of thing, some of our learners will have an ABR test, which is an auditory brain stem response to auditory stimuli. Um, and if there is an abnormality in that brainstem, it might result in this AN, which is also called auditory dyssynchrony. Say that three times fast. I, I can't. It's hard for me. Third, and then we'll see if there are questions. A sensory neural hearing loss does the same thing as a conductive hearing loss in that it attenuates the sound received by the brain, or it weakens the auditory stimuli that are perceived by the brain. Sensory neural loss may also distort the perception of sound, and a sensory neural hearing loss is permanent. Hearing aids may be used to address conductive hearing losses. Hearing aids aren't going to do squat to lessen the effects of a sensory neural hearing loss because the sensory neural loss is a problem with the auditory nerve itself or the brain stem or something else and a hearing aid is not going to address that. Teresa, do we have any questions? Yes, Susan, I actually have three. So I'm going to start with the one that is around hearing and then there were two that came in in round vision. So the first oh. question for you in regard to hearing is, is hearing loss as much in the brain as vision? Can be, but I would say no. I would say there's a smaller percentage of hearing losses that are due to conductive issues or that are due to issues with the optic nerve, pardon me, the auditory nerve. And most people, even though the auditory nerve is part of the, of the 
central nervous system, I don't think people would categorize that as in the brain. It's part of this, this, the neurologic system, but it's not the brain itself. And we're gonna talk about the kind of hearing loss that is centered in the brain. It is real, it does exist, but it is, exists in a minority of cases. Thank you, Susan. And I'm gonna give you these two together um, because I think they're somewhat similar. Okay. What does fatigue look like in vision loss? And then what does the behavior look like when a kiddo is experiencing visual fatigue? Okay. Um, real quick, just because I don't wanna dismiss your questions. They're great questions, but I wanna make sure we get through the hearing. And if we have to, we'll circle back around at the end. Fatigue just means just like if you if you've just done a 5k run or you've walked six miles or and your body you just feel like i'm too tired to go on it may just look like that it may just be i am exhausted and the kids may not depending on their cognitive level they may not be able to say i can't look at this stuff anymore i'm too tired i'm worn out okay but it may be that it may be that their eyes start to burn. It may be that they're covering their eyes. It may be that they're putting their heads down on their desk. It may be that their whole body just wears out because like when you're learning something that's so challenging for you to learn, have you ever said just even jokingly, my brain's tired. You know, I need a break. I've got to have a break. That's what that's what I'm referring to when I say fatigue. And in terms of your question, it's a great question. What does it look like? <laughs> Anything. It could be they cover their eyes, they put their heads down, they act out. If it's a learner who experiences challenging behavior, they may start throwing things. They may elope. They may, if, if it's a learner who has demonstrated self-injurious behavior, they may start hurting themselves. It literally can be anything and it's going to be matched up with how well that learner communicates. If that kid has a good communication system and is very symbolic and can say, I need a break, then chances are you're not gonna have a kid who's running or throwing or biting or hurting himself. But if kids are not symbolic and they don't have a conventional communication system, they are going to quote, tell you enough, man, I'm worn out. I can't look at this stuff anymore. You're pushing me too hard. They won't tell you any way they can tell you. And um, with that, I would, Teresa, if you think it's acceptable, I'd like to keep moving and we could circle back around if we have to, if people will follow up in the chat. Is that Absolutely. fair? And the answer was sufficient. Thank you. Okay. We like sufficient too. Then we got this magic category, but I'll bet every one of you has at some point, if you've taught more than a couple of years, um, you've said, oh, mixed hearing loss. Thanks. That term versus a combination hearing loss is typically used to refer to a loss that is believed to be both conductive and sensory neural. So of the two main categories I've described, conductive and sensory neural is a mixed loss if those are joint. So let's talk about this hearing loss that's in the brain. Because last time I said, and I think some people probably thought I was crazy, and that's fine. Uh, sometimes I am, that we really hear with our brains too. And whereas we talk about CVI in regard to a processing loss in vision, we talk about CAPD for a central auditory processing disorder or the loss of functional hearing ability that is centered in the brain. And I would say to you that in my opinion, and this is just Susan Bashinsky's opinion, I can't find anything to back it up. Um, I think that we are just now, and by that I mean in the last five to eight years, really learning about CAPD. I think we are now in, C, with, in regard to CAPD where we were 20 years ago or more in regard to CVI we're lagging behind because this one is more abstract because we can't, it's not as easy to check out and test and substitute wooden numerals for red numerals when you're talking about hearing. 
So we've got a whole lot to learn about CAPD, but it's real. And my most challenging personal experience in regard to getting kids qualified for a label of deafblind so we could include them on the census and get them services through the deafblind grants is if I had a learner, there's one little guy's name was Duke, and I would have sworn on anything and everyone dear to me that Duke had a central auditory processing disorder. But this was in 2004, and we didn't know much about it at that time. It was just coming on the scene as a thing, but we really didn't know how to diagnosis, diagnose it. I couldn't get an audiologist to buy into what I was saying, and it was really tough. We finally got him qualified, but it was really tough because what this has to do with is inconsistent hearing, just as the, the same definition about vision. It's an inconsistency due to some problem in the cortex or in the auditory pathways, the way the neurons hook up in the brain so they don't process auditory information in a typical fashion. And with CAPD, the outer ear, the middle ear, the inner ear, they're not impaired, okay? It's the brain that shows the impairment. Man, sometimes it'll let me advance one way and sometimes it won't. Signs of CAPD, and this is where we just you just collect anecdotal information and you just bombard your audiologist with it. So if there's any audiologist, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm telling people to bombard you with this information. Um, Kids will show difficulties localizing sound, figuring out where the sound's coming from. They may show difficulty in discriminating sounds, auditory discrimination, and they will likely show difficulty processing quick sound sequences or figuring out discerning patterns in sounds. Two additional signs of CAPD include some kind of weakening of auditory skills when there's competing background noise. If you're in a real noisy environment, either because too many people are talking or because there's just noise in the environment itself. A fifth one is there may be a weakening of auditory skill with degraded signals, like a poor cell phone connection, or if you've got cable TV and it's going in and out and it's not you know, equally strong, it's fading, you're gonna see discrepancies in a learner's auditory skills. And these five, these three and these two, these are all signs of CAPD that I've taken from the ASHA, American Speech Language Hearing Association website, okay? Then we're gonna talk about combination problems. Always gotta talk about combination problems and this is, different than a mixed hearing loss, right? Mixed hearing loss is, con is conductive loss and sensory neural loss. When we talk about combination hearing impairments, we're talking about unilateral or bilateral intensity loss and or frequency loss and or conductive loss and or sensory neural loss and or central auditory processing disorder. We just get these different kinds and degrees of combinations, okay? So one, do we need to stop, Teresa? Do we have questions at this point? No questions, thank you for asking. Okay, so let's take, take a look at um, this notion of intensity and frequency, and then we'll just be to the hearing reminders. The first thing I wanna say about this, this is again from ASHA, um, but these levels, you know, I've tried to specify mild is 26 to 40 decibel loss, mild to moderate, 41 to 55, you can read the numbers, I'm not going to read them to you. I would say to you, these numbers are not absolute. We pretty much can say legal blindness is 2200 or less right? And it's pretty absolute. We don't have that luxury with these degrees of the intensity of loss, all right? So this means that a loss is considered mild if that learner hears sounds louder than 40 for sure or in this range. And so on profound loss, 
things have to be 91 decibels loud. And this is the way you write decibels. You abbreviate lowercase d, uppercase b, or louder. But don't get hung up on these numbers because they're not reliable. They're guidelines. Keep the guardrails up, but mm, we can't come in on specifics, all right? So where are these shown? The picture that illustrates what a learner hears is called an audiogram, or the best that uh, auditory testing or brainstem audiometry can um, illustrate the range through which and the frequencies through which a learner functionally hears is called an audiogram. And that audiogram simultaneously describes the learner's sensitivity in terms of both, both the intensity or the loudness or the volume and the frequency or the hertz, like the rent a car, yep, hertz, or the pitch, how high or how low. And it's a complicated instrument, but I wanted to show this to you. And this is what an audiogram looks like. In this particular example, the circles or the ovals through here are depicting the right ear. X's are depicting the left ear. After I turned this in to the ladies at the Montana Project, I thought this probably isn't the best example because I'm trying to tell you that the losses in the two ears are not necessarily the same. And this example I'm giving you shows them identical. So my bad, I apologize. If you have an audiogram with a learner for a learner that looks exactly like this, it's amazing. I, I don't know why I did this. It was not a good choice on my part, and I apologize. Usually you're gonna have one line that's gonna do one thing and the other line is gonna do something different. Maybe they'll be close, all right? Another way that audiograms are often displayed is they're in color. They'll use ovals for both, but the red will be for the right ear, and I was always grateful for that because I could remember R, R red, R right, okay, and blue for the left ear. And this is a real complicated depiction because it's not a regular graph. You know, it's not like you buy graph paper and you do this picture. Those of you who, who took advanced mathematics, you were familiar with logarithmic graph paper. And this is a logarithmic scale, all right? It's an exponentially increasing scale. And you don't have to remember that, but I just want you to know it's not an equal, one box is the same as the next box and so on, because it's not. On the x-axis, it talks about the frequencies. Frequencies are measured in hertz, and you can see, these intervals between these bars are not nearly the same because it's an exponential function. The y-axis is the hearing level in decibels or how loud the sound is. This is how high or how low the sound is or the pitch, and you get this picture. I think the most important thing for us as families and as education professionals who are not trained in audiology a learner hears, okay, what is under this line. The loss is depicted as what is above the line. This is the loss. This learner misses out on all the sounds that would come in up here. This learner hears all the sounds that come in under the line, okay? That's really important because that's what you need to be able to do is read it. Here is a picture of what's called a speech banana. Those of you who are speech language pathologists, you're going, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But this shows you, and you see how it gets its name, that these symbols in here represent the sounds of English spoken language, all right? And you can see that they're not way up here. These are soft bird song, leaves rustling, water dripping, You've got to get down into a moderate level where most of the speech sounds are. But if you would go back, again, not using these as absolutes, but you see a moderate loss could be mid 50s to 70. If you look at this mid 50, whoops, I'm on the wrong screen. Mid 50s to 70, you're gonna start losing some of these sounds. And by the time you get to severe loss, you're down here and you've lost 
lots if not all of the speech sounds and it shows you that a jet plane is way down here and some kids with profound hearing loss they could still hear a jet plane or amplified guitar music so it's just kind of an awareness thing for where the speech sounds fall hearing ability is indicated uh, by the point of intensity at which a learner indicates she can just barely hear a sound okay you don't have to say it's super clear but I hear something, all right? Functional hearing abilities are also affected by what's called a sound to noise ratio, all right? A sound to noise ratio. And this refers to sounds meaning the things you want the learner to hear, the spoken instructions, the spoken video recording, the spoken announcements over a, a loudspeaker, the focus auditory stimuli. Noise is all the other clutter and junk. And you might say, well, we turn everything else off. And I would still challenge you to say there's so much ambient noise in classroom environments. There's noise from the heating ducts. There's noise from the air conditioners. There's in a computer lab, there's noise from all those computers. There's noise from electrical connections. There's noise from ventilation. There's all kinds of noise. And we need to be sensitive to that when we're working with kids with hearing loss or kids with deaf blindness. I also would say you need to think about the distance of the learner from the sound source because the sound weakens the further you are from the source of the sound and every one of us can identify with that on our own right sure we can so kim if you'd be kind enough would you launch the fourth poll please so what i'm asking is which is another one choose one choose two choose three choose four which of the following are examples of vision loss? Ah, oh, that's a typo. Hearing loss, sorry, it's typed wrong on my paper. Kim took care of me. Which of the following are examples of hearing loss, thank you, that might qualify a learner for services under the label of deaf blindness? A conductive hearing loss? A central auditory processing disorder? loss of sound intensity, loss of sound frequency. And while they're responding, Susan, this is Kim, I'll let you know that I didn't actually discover that and the typo until about six minutes ago and quickly got it corrected. So um, my apologies for missing it. Well, hey, mine, uh, you know, obviously I read it off my paper and read it wrong, even though I've been talking about hearing for the last 20 minutes. So we, again, we we got it together that didn't sound right together you and i got it figured out how about that that's that's great okay and we're, we're at about 55 percent voting so let's do another 30 seconds and then i'll close the poll okay Okay, Susan, I will go ahead and close it. It looks like the answers have stopped coming in. Okay. Okay, now there it is. I tell you, boy, I think if if I were if this were a course and I had to assign grades and the rest of that sentence is thank goodness I don't, you guys are all A students because you you're you're you got it. It's this is another question. I'm really not trying to be a smart aleck. All four answers are correct. And 85% of you identified all four or three of the four, and we came in pretty darn close, even with sound intensity. Just losing volume can, if it is significant enough, may qualify a learner for services under deafblind label. So all four, yay. I so appreciate your attention and um you're making me feel really good today. So thank you for that. I needed that on a stormy, stormy Wednesday in Missouri. So now my slides won't move again. So we're gonna wind this up with the hearing reminders. 
There are many, many, many of these. I think there's 12 or 13 of them. This is one handout that Kim and Teresa and Ellen have provided for you. I'm not, I don't have slides on all of them. Again, it's an issue of time, but you do have the handout. And I've divided the handout in terms of noise, acoustics, sound characteristics, and technology, because I hope that that might help you sort these reminders as we go through them real quickly. And it will move that way. This is just incredible. I would say that one of the important things to remember is that for the majority, and this is a majority, of learners who experience some kind of significant hearing loss, so I'd say severe to profound, maybe even moderate, mm, depends, they really don't hear a difference between things in the foreground and things in the background. It's just all mixed up together. And we need to remember that. And hearing aids can compound this problem. Because, again, I use color, a hearing aid amplifies all the sounds in the environment. A hearing aid doesn't only amplify speech, human speech sounds. A hearing aid amplifies the traffic going by and the fire drill. I've had kids rip their hearing aids off when the fire drill goes off. It amplifies all the sounds and that's, that's a problem. Okay, and some sometimes the challenge of persuading kids to wear a hearing aid or wear their cochlear implant is because it amplifies everything and it's just too annoying or hurtful, painful, or they can't focus. And we need to remember this and, and take it to heart and, and try to pay attention to the sound to noise ratio in our classrooms, in our homes, in our job sites, wherever we're working with learners with deaf blindness. And the way we do this is we try the best we can to reduce the amount of ambient noise, which is that auditory clutter, those auditory distractions that are in a learner's environment. We can also manage the direction from which instructional stimuli of an auditory nature are presented. You do this. I'll bet you guys do this already. If you know that a child has a severe hearing loss on the left, a mild hearing loss on the right, you know you need to sit on that learner's right. You know you need to provide the directions, the instructions, the whatever, from that kid's right side. That's what I'm talking about here. So cheers, I know you do that, I know you do. We need to try to analyze and identify characteristics of sounds with which a learner, an individual learner is most successful. The types of the sound sources. Is it mechanical? Is it human voice? Is it digitized voice? Is it artificial of some other nature? How loud? And again, super loud is not always better, right? What are those frequencies? Is it super high pitched? Is it medium pitched? Is it low pitched? Is it through the whole range of pitch? We need to consider also in regard to type and loudness and frequency, we need to consider the distance of the sound source. And that is especially true when we're thinking about volume, which is the second one, loudness of the sound. Because you know, if somebody is talking to you from too far away, you can't hear them. So what do you do? You go closer to them or you ask them to come closer to you because the distance is too great. You know this stuff. We just have to apply it to the kids we teach. Assistive listening devices, FM systems in classrooms, other assistive listening devices can help reduce noise and facilitate meaningful processing of meaningful sounds. In other words, they can help us shift that sound to noise ratio in the favor of sound or speech sound or the teacher's voice. Just remember if you're using an FM system when you step out in the hall to have a private conversation or use the restroom or do something else, turn it off. Finally, even if a learner's auditory system adequately receives the environmental information, the auditory nerve picks up the auditory stimuli and sends it to the brain, 
the learner might not process that information accurately or adequately. And that's the issue of CAPD, Central Auditory Processing Disorder. And the last one, you're gonna say, did you just copy this from the vision section? And I'll say, uh-huh, almost. For kids who have significant hearing loss, attending to auditory stimuli can be extremely tiring. They wear out, they fatigue. So we need to be conscious of stamina. And Kim, if you would at this point, I'm gonna keep talking, which so I maybe shouldn't ask you to do this, but I'd ask you to launch the last poll. The things that I said to you all about how might fatigue manifest when a kid fatigues because of vision overstimulation, I would say to you, the kid may show the same behaviors, observable behaviors, if he fatigues because of too much auditory input, okay? So here's your question. It's another one, choose all that apply. Regarding the hearing reminders we've just reviewed, which of the following are true? A majority of learners with a label of hearing loss are able to differentiate between foreground and background sounds. Second, it's recommended that the amount of ambient noise in a learning environment be reduced as much as possible. Number three, a hearing aid helps to reduce the amount of noise because it only amplifies speech sounds. And number four, paying attention to auditory stimuli can cause noticeable fatigue in a learner who experiences significant hearing loss. One, two, three, or four. And this is Kim Susan. We'll give about yep. 30 seconds for people to finish voting. Okay. Okay, great response rate on that one. I'll go ahead and close and share the answers. Yes. Again, three cheers to all of you. There are two correct answers. They're shown here in green and yellow with 94 and 88% people identifying them. Yeah, yeah. We want to reduce ambient noise and pay attention because too much auditory stimuli, too many auditory stimuli can cause fatigue. Um, hearing aids do not only amplify speech, they amplify everything. And that's a really important point. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to repeat that. So to close for today, um, geez. I just would, this, I said this at least twice last time, so I gotta say it once. Kids who have a, la a label of deaf blindness, they're incredibly heterogeneous as a group. You've met one kid with deaf blindness, good for you. You've met one kid with deaf blindness, they're different from one another. Some great resources um, are, the, are produced in regard to deaf blindness by the Sky High Institute at Utah State University. All you have to do is, is Google Sky High Institute. They have incredible resources. One of my favorites is called Sensory Perspectives. It's a simulation exercise. So if you want something to look at, take a look at that. Here's my contact information. If you wanna email me, you wanna call me, I'll get back to you. I try to be quick, I'm not always quick, but I wanna to conclude today before we see what other questions there are by just thanking Kim and Teresa and Ellen and our two captioners, I know I talk fast, bless you for keeping up with me. And ladies, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to share my thoughts on deaf blindness with your folks from your project and all of you participants who took an hour and a half out of what I know are your crazy busy days. I thank you, I'm grateful, and I really appreciate it. 
and if there are questions, I'll hang around. I think it's 3.28 by my clock, but I'll stay until we have to close it if there are questions. Great, thank you very much, Susan. This is Kim, and before I, I check with Teresa, I do want to make a couple of housekeeping remarks so that people sure. who have to log off right on time can do so. I did put the link for our short evaluation in the chat box. It will also be in the follow-up email that you receive in about an hour today. Please do take the time to click on that link and fill out our survey for us or our evaluation. We really value your input. The final session in our Introduction to Deaf Blindness webinar series will take place on April 21st from 1 to 2.30 Mountain Time. It's unique learning needs and building structure through routines. We will be delighted to welcome Susan back once again. The registration for that session is already open. You can go to either of our websites, the Transition and Employment Projects or the Montana Deaf Blind Project website and register. Or you can let me know if you have a difficulty finding where the registration is and I can help you get registered. And a reminder that the recording to today's session will be posted to both of those websites. It can take a couple of weeks for us to get the captions added and the recordings posted, but they will be there so that you can review the information or share it with others who are interested. Um, I would like to echo Susan's gratitude to all of you and to the captioning professionals, to Teresa, to Ellen, and especially to Susan for the great information today. For those of you who have to leave, thank you for being here. Um, Teresa, were there any questions that you wanted to pop out there real quickly for Susan? There are not, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you all again. Sincerely appreciate your joining us. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you.